everyone, and welcome to this conversation presented by White House Custom Color. I'm Jed Toffer. Thanks for listening. You know, my wife Vicki and I have owned and operated our photography studio, V Gallery, for 20 years now. White House has been our lab for the last 16 of those years, and we could not be happier. White House is a family-run business, just like ours. If you haven't already, check them out at whcc.com. And if you want to drop me a line, feel free to email me at jed at whcc.com. I remember when my dad turned 40. I thought he was so old. You know, there's that over the hill thing and all. Now I'm 45 and 40 doesn't seem so old anymore. In fact, 60 doesn't seem so old anymore. On the other hand, doing something for 45 years does seem like a long time, but in more of a notable achievement sort of way, something to be admired or strived for. John Hartman has been photographing for as long as I've been alive. He is an absolute master at his craft, and he has some fantastic insights for newcomers and for veterans alike. One of my favorite parts of this conversation is when he addresses retirement and says, people retire to do what I do. How awesome is that? If you're on the front end of this business, consider those words and that concept. You'll be 45 or 60 or beyond before you know it. And if you're still blazing trails the way John has been during his career, you'll have something special to look back on and to keep you moving forward, just like him. I'm sure that when we were the young guns, that the old guys ahead of us hated us. And said the same things. It just wasn't social media back then. Yeah, they're you know those yeah, the guys, these young guys different. are nipping on our tails right. and they're stealing our business. And right. you know, so I don't know that this is necessarily a new thing as much as it is a perspective thing. Right. You know, because those folks coming up don't think they're stepping on our toes. They're just going for what they can get, and it just so happens that they're getting what we had. You know what I mean? Do you look? Do you look at it that way? I. I think that, you know, I know I stepped on some old guy's toes when I was, when I was younger. Um, I didn't think of it like that. I just thought like, well, you know, if you're not going to do it, I'll, if you don't want the business, I'll take it. You didn't maliciously no, and I'm try purpose. to hurt nope. anyone's and I don't think, business or life. No, nor do I think that anybody who is up and coming today has even the perspective to know that that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I happen to know this because there, this is happening in every industry. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the music business, the mm-hmm. the the writing business, the uh, the acting. I mean, there's everybody, the video business. You know, everybody is um, because technology has made things. The buy-in so easy for so many people. The barrier to entry is yeah, so low. Yeah, right. it's pretty simple to 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 go in and do it. And frankly, there's some really great youngsters that are yeah. doing some killer stuff. Now, there's a lot of middling stuff too. Right. And I think the the problem is that the focus is on, um, you know, the focus for the old people are looking at only looking at the the people who are really doing a bad job and saying, well, they're you know they're crapping on the industry well in the meantime they're not focusing on the the young kids the guns that are out there knocking them dead why because there's more of the more of the other right is that it is that the sole reason is because there's just that much more as a like there's that much more inferior work than there is well i don't know that there is uh, again because of the 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 because of the 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 low buy-in i think there are probably a, there's probably, yes, there are more people. And mm-hmm. B, I also think that they're more visible, way more visible. Because when I was first starting out, I had no visibility. The only way I got visible was to learn marketing and direct mail and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Because there was no social media. There was no right. mainstream advertising of any right. kind. And so my direct mail was like just me to the customer and my competition, unless they happened to know somebody who gathered, which as I did, right. has said, hey, give me all the mailings that you get and I'll pay you $5 for each one. And so I would see what everybody else is doing, right. but there's that's no way what, of knowing. That's what we used to do. Yeah, yeah, nobody else knows that. <laughs> so so that, you know, I, I'm looking at that as sort of a, um, a, uh, a, a, a real problem for this industry in that we don't look at it from a larger perspective of a this is happening to other businesses and b this has always been going on 
just maybe not in the way or maybe not in the in the intensity nor in the visibility as it was before but it's this has always been going on i agree with you and don't you think that primarily it's technology that amps everything up sure absolutely essentially right and i think you know maybe there's a c part of this and that is that a lot of the older generation for lack of a better word is not as adaptive to that new technology. Exactly. And so they're getting burned, and it's it's that hurts, too. That's another variable yeah, yeah. in the equation. Yeah, because everybody always thought, well, you know, I'm good, and I've got an established name, and I've got mm-hmm. I've got visibility, and people like what I do. and mm-hmm. But, you know, customer loyalty is at all-time low. People will jump ship for one reason or another. And sure. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But, um, you know, I had a discussion. Well, I remember the discussion with Greg Gorman at... Yeah. Uh, you know, and just like, hey, that even that industry is totally right. turned upside down. Right. You know, so there's it was it was sobering to hear how somebody like him can be affected by that yeah. as well. Yeah. And it really leveled things out for me. Right. Because I like I think a lot of times we look at whoever, and we have these perceptions. And Jeremy Cowart's talked about this on Facebook, mm-hmm. where he know, he knows that people look at him and they glamorize him and his life. And oh, you just have just money funneling into your your bank account on a on a daily basis, and it's like, no, I still got to I I got to get out there and make it happen mm-hmm. all the time, just like everybody else. Yeah. What What do you think is a solution for someone that's struggling and and seeing the whippersnappers, so to speak, come in and step on their toes, so to speak, to use your words. Part of it has been, I think my, my philosophy in life is, first of all, it's not a philosophy. First of all, I get bored very easily. And so I'm moving on, always finding, okay, what's the next thing? And, but my philosophy is find out what everybody else is doing and then don't do it. Mm -hmm. And if you have, if you're constantly, um, blazing trails, you're, you don't have to worry too much about, um, you know, trying to do what everybody else is doing. Cause when, when you do that, the only, you become a commodity. And of course the only, uh, the, the, the only force majeure you have is your pricing and, and nobody wins on that deal. Cause it's a race to the bottom. I, I, th- I agree with yeah. that. I could not agree with you more. Yeah. And when you're blazing those trails, you don't even have time to worry about who else is doing what right. at all. Right. And, you know, it, it, this came up last night at my presentation on light painting. Mm-hmm. Um, it, interestingly, the vast majority of my workshop attendees are in their 50s and 60s. They're older. I don't get 20-somethings that come in because they're struggling trying to figure out off-camera flash, you mm-hmm. know. And so this is a very different dynamic. But what I've discovered is that this is another niche that in – you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, um, I discovered high speed sync when it first came out, when Canon first introduced it and thought that was really cool and blazed that trail and got tired of that. And <laughs> I just started doing infrared photography. I had a camera with an infrared sensor put on it and that was really cool for a while. Mm-hmm. And then I started doing HDR and when that was brand new and wasn't even, you couldn't even do it on Photoshop. You had to have special software for right. it. And then, then I started doing panoramics, and I started a- doing HDR panoramics. And one time, I did an HDR infrared panoramic <laughs> with a person in it. You, you know, mix them like, all together. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the idea was that, like, you know, just try something new and see right. see what sticks. Throw it right. against the wall and see if it sticks. But light painting has been, for me, has been uh, um, an interesting addition to my mix because of the fact that it it doesn't. Um, it doesn't interfere with what I'm doing in my normal daily right. studio work, right? But it also creates a. Um, first of all, it, it's very. It's not something that you can just do. My comment to photographers ask me what it, you know, what, do judges like this? For example, do, do they get it? And I say sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But judges will often look at a photograph, and I think photographers in general will look at a photograph and they'll say, "Oh, it's a soft background, so it must have been f two eight. And I'm looking at their eyes, and there's round catch lights in them. So they used a round umbrella, and I see a little kicker light on the other side. So they must have had a little wink flash on the other side. And, and you know, there's a, you know, a long perspective, so they must have used a telephoto lens. And so they can go, yeah, I could do that. Mm-hmm. And so then I'll show them a picture of a 
the light painted car. I said, there's 106 photographs in this picture. Show me where they are. <laughs> and they can't. They can't deconstruct it because not. it's not possible. Right. So in that res respect, it becomes a, you know, people look at it and go, I, I just, you know, when I first saw a light painting, I said, that's really cool. I don't have, have, any, I have any idea how they did that. Mm -hmm. And I want to find out how. Mm -hmm. And so personally, this has been the thing that's sort of, kept me um, not only excited about photography, but also breaking ground and, and finding clients who I already have. Right. You know, I'm already working in the, in the, with clients who have stuff that needs to be light painted. And also working with um, corporate accounts yeah. whose CEOs also have stuff. So sometimes the, the, uh, the business will start in the corporate end and migrate over to light painting for either personal uses or even for the corporate Well, it's a use. natural progression. Right. It's or the other way around. It starts off as a light painting. And then goes the other photographing way. Photographing somebody's, some CEO who has a bunch of Corvettes and then right. we start talking about their business and right. their needs and so forth. So it's a, um, and that, you know, th that can involve portraiture, can involve product photography, whatever. But um, that is a, you know, that's a kind of work at least for me personally, that I know, first of all, once I've established those relationships, um, people aren't going to bail on me. And I've sort of allowed that to um, be burnt into my process, for example. And primarily because of the relationship. Right. It's, not... it's, all, it's all, almost all about the relationship. Right. But right. Some, of it's a, some of it's kind of a backdoor thing, too. Like, for example, we do team photographs, uh, management team mm -hmm. portraits and stuff. And I always suggest to the, the, the person in charge why don't we instead of doing a group picture because that as soon as you take that group picture in three months it's going to be out of date because someone's going right, to leave right. so let's just do everybody individual i mm -hmm. photograph them facing one way and the other and i'll capture them and i'll cut them out and we'll put them in a group photograph and then if somebody leaves then we can take them out and if we can put the new person yeah. i'll photograph them exactly the same way right. you'll never know right and you know put shadows behind them everything it just looks like a team photograph and you know, they buy into that. And I said, you know, the best thing about this is that we don't have to have the, your team of 17 lawyers each paid $300 an hour to sit for a portrait because right. that, the, their, their time is more valuable than the money you're going to pay right. me for that photograph. And, they, you know, they jump on that like, you know. Because uh, they get it right away. Right, get right, it. right. So, of course, when that happens, I'm the guy. <laughs> then they're, they're never going to have they're never going to have they're never going to go anywhere else well there's pictures. the relationship piece but then in that scenario there's also the technical piece because you have access to the files that they actually need like right. you have the master file that requ that has all those layers in it where you can swap in and out Right. Super easy. And if they didn't, even if they went to somebody else, even if they had the layered file, which I would never give them, but even if they did, right. they wouldn't be able to make no. make the person look no, like no, I no. do. So, but they would never have that to begin with. Right, right. <laughs> no, I know that. But, but so, you know, I think, uh, I think the majority of struggling that's going on now is that the photographers who should know better are, you know, the old saying, if you something isn't working and you keep doing it trying to make it fixed that you're just going to keep doing what doesn't work mm -hmm. and uh, and i think there needs to be some and you know when we were younger we figured out ways around things because we were able to i think our mind was uh, a lot more flexible mm. and i also think we didn't know any better so we would just go and do things and not know that they couldn't work and make them work <laughs> okay and you know the older you get i think the more defensive you become yeah and uh and so there is, uh, there's a lot of that. I see that a lot of that in the industry. And I've, I've, when I started doing the boot camps in the late nineties, you know, that was before things started turning south for a lot of the industry. But I watched every year because every year when people would register, um, I would make them or I'd ask them to submit a complete survey of their business down to how many photo shoots you did of yeah. each each product line, what each average sale was, how many employees you had, mm -hmm. gross sales, you know, and then track that over the years. And I could see long before, I think a lot of people did, that there was actually, this is, there was a serious issue going on here. And it was, I knew it was, it was serious because these are the same, you know, half the audience came every year. So we had a pretty good track record. It wasn't sure. like there are new people you every had lots year of coming in. Important data. A lot of, lot of data. And mm -hmm. it was very, um, it was very enlightening because at that point, then I decided, okay, 
survival is not going to happen if you keep doing the same thing. So what are you going to do that's different? So every year there's always something a little bit different. And that was nice to be in that position, I think, at the time, only because, um, you know, I I could see and make changes probably before they had to be changed. Could have had the luxury of changing it when uh, on my own timetable. And Mm -hmm. so that, that made it a little bit easier. But in general, I think the... Um, the industry is healthy. I think, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's necessarily, uh, a declining product demand as much as there is possibly there's more, um, there's more providers. Right. And, but there's still a lot of money to be made in this, in this industry, but it's just, you get to figure out who your niche is, where your market is. And then yet, like you said about Jeremy, you have to work that market. You can't just expect you know hang your shingle out and expect the business to come right right and that was what was expected you know i mean 20 30 years ago that was the you know i'm a photographer i know what i'm doing right and and how is that well because you know back in the day um if you did not produce or you couldn't produce every click of the shutter was a dollar yeah so it didn't take long to weed out those that, that couldn't do it. Oh, now you just click and look at the back of the camera and eventually you get something. And if you can't, if it's a, even a little something, you can fix it in Photoshop. You know, I remember being frustrated as heck when I got a light stand in my photograph because it costs another $30 to take that out. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's hard to even, I, I do remember those days vaguely but because yeah. we weren't in those days for very long but we we were in those days and that's true it was it was a much yeah. bigger deal on the other hand when i was done at the end of the day i handed mm. my film off to my associate and yeah. i never saw it again yeah you know? the other the other side yeah. of that coin yeah it was very nice you know and, and um you know there was there was an efficiencies there as well so for you personally though get, so given the stuff that you've said this is where my mind's going you've you've you went through kind of some of the stuff you've done in the last five, 10 years or so. And you, you mentioned infrared and HDR and panos and whatnot. And now it's of course light painting and you're, you, you really establish yourself as at least in my experience, the go-to guy for light painting. When I hear somebody like Dan McClanahan say, I'm, I'm taking this Hartman workshop because I, I want to know more about light painting. And I think to myself, that's pretty awesome. Like if I'm in your shoes, I'm feeling pretty good about, about what I'm capable of doing and what I've sort of built in this space because you have someone like Dan wanting to learn more from you in a workshop, right? This is my perspective. But I'm also thinking from your perspective then, you've been doing this a while and your, your tendency as an artist and as someone that is creative is to then also want to move on to what's next are you are you close to that in the cycle with light painting or are you are you at the beginning of the cycle with light painting or in the middle where where are you at with that do you think it's still fun okay and part of it part of the the thing for me is and I was, i'm at the stage of my career where i can i don't have to do anything but i can do whatever i want to right. do so right. yes. you know it, as long as it Continues to be fun, and I can yeah. see, think, and walk. Right. Those are the, the four criteria that will allow me to continue to do this. I'm often asking, uh, especially you know, my local clients, when are you going to retire? And I go, you know, people retire to do what I do. Yeah, isn't that something? So that's why true. I got a 45 year head start on them? Why right. would I want to quit now? Right. You know? And and think about think about creatives that are still around. Mick Jagger still singing, yeah. you know, and and. Uh, um, cause he's doing what he yeah, wants. And Tom Hanks is still acting. They, yeah. they don't need to do this stuff. No. They do it because they enjoy it. And yeah. I'll, and I'll continue doing whatever I'm doing, whether it's with a camera or something else sure. until it's no longer fun. Right. Um, I'm finding though that the, the, you know, there, I don't have anybody to look up to, to try to like see who's the, you know, how do I get, how do I advance where I'm going in light right. painting? So I got to blaze my own trail. And mm-hmm. in some ways that's really good. In some ways it's very inefficient. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, it does produce um, some good results. And it does allow me to be able to show other people what I've done so that they can short circuit the mistakes that I made. And I think the reason that 
and you talked about Dan, but we had a lot of photographers who are well known in the industry who wanted to learn this just because uh, they're curious. Right. They say, "I want to know what this is because I saw that picture and I don't know how I, f- I don't know how you did it either." Right. And some of them are, uh, you know, some some folks who have done this uh, come and just go, you know, I don't intend to do anything with this. I just want to, I just find it fascinating. Right. right. And um, the, and and interestingly, the majority of my workshop students are not professional photographers. What? Um, yeah, the vast majority of them are not. I didn't they're, realize that. Yeah, they're they're people who are interested in photography. They have it as a side. They might be, you know, in the corporate world or huh. manufacturing world or engineering world or aviation world, but they're not full time photographers. Um, but most of them, you know, see that see that it's an interesting process. How much of your passion overall is split between the the photographic creative process and then the teaching? process how do those line up the the teaching part emanates i don't feel qualified to teach anything until i really have it down mm-hmm. myself mm-hmm. and so i never go out there and say well this is what i would do you know mm-hmm. i have to say this is what i did <laughs> i love that yeah well i mean we this all is know what that, i have done <laughs> yeah this right. is this is what i think you should do right. well, are you doing that well no but i think you <laughs> should do it. that right i mean if they were honest they would say that right a lot of times yeah. sure so um no i i think you know i i really enjoy seeing light bulbs go off yeah. and especially with something like this where you know i mean I taught marketing and and i think for a lot of people that was a big question mark for a lot of people back you know, it still is today, you know, like, how do I get my business up and running? Mm. And, but the, there wasn't like an ABC process for that. Mm. You know, there was a lot of other, that was a very complicated process too, which is again, I think why nobody else did marketing boot camps because it was, it was, it was a hard thing. You know, yeah. there, there's usually like three or four people on the marketing circuit in PPV when I first started out and it's, and, and because nobody jumped on that, you right. know, as opposed to someone who does posing and lighting or babies or weddings, you know, mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of people out there teaching it right. for better or worse. Right. Um, right. But, I, but I enjoy the, you know, the, the teaching thing has never been a big part of what I do. Um, I, cause I've always felt like you really can't teach until you do. Mm-hmm. And so that's, you know, I try to do more than that, more doing than teaching. Mm-hmm. But what I learn from doing, I can bring out in the, in the in the teaching world, which and it's fun. I still really enjoy it. I used to t- teach to two or three hundred. Uh, last night we had fifteen hundred people in the room. Did you really? They had a click count, and, and they, I said I had no idea that there were that many people there. Wow. And um, but I really like you know these small group things that we're doing now. The workshops where we have like like four to eight people mm-hmm. or ten people, because you know the you have a lot more impact on a person. Sure. And it's a very different teaching dynamic than teaching to a group of 200 completely and, different yeah yeah and it's um it's much less structured a lot less pressure you know i couldn't i don't know that i could do another i mean at, looking back it was pretty i did some really crazy things and it all worked but when you were doing all the <laughs> yeah, big boot camps yeah, with like, all those people like i didn't know that you couldn't do this but i did it anyway you know <laughs> now i know that you can't do it so i don't do it so you, you know don't. yeah i know <laughs> But um, what sort of advice do you have? Because so, so, we've kind of talked about, especially from your perspective now, and your and your, I would say your colleagues and your peers that are older like us, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, what have I said? I've said if there are like four different segments to the industry. One is the brand new photographer. Two is somebody that's not brand new, but they're not all that experienced. Three is somebody that is experienced has kind of been there and done that and and then four is like the veteran right so you and me are in the three and four range probably we're on this certainly on the second half of that mm-hmm. and we've talked about what what that's like and 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 sort of advice that you have for people that are there what advice do you have for the people that are on the front half that are in the ones and the twos the ones that are maybe doing the toe stepping intentional or not. And we'll, mm-hmm. and we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say sure. they're not doing anything maliciously, but what sort of advice do you have for them? What do you, t- what do you say to them? Well, I, th- I get calls like this actually all the time. Mm-hmm. And my feeling is that you really need to 
you need to study with someone who is where you want to be, number one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not just not just something that you see in a YouTube video, but, but you know, someone who's really walking the walk. Mm-hmm. And that may be difficult for someone who is brand new to the industry to discover yeah. because sometimes the biggest names aren't the ones you necessarily want to or need to study with. Right. Um, but I think that the education is, you know, key to this whole thing. Mm. And I'm not saying that you can't learn anything on YouTube. We all have. But I think that there's a that there's a, a definite need and a definite benefit to live instruction as well uh, or even a mentoring a one-on-one or small group thing because you just get a whole lot more from that all the times that I grew in my business uh, I went to you know to see people that I really respected Mm. and meant a lot to me and still do actually to this day and they um, they were they were doing what they say they were doing Mm. And I know that today because they're very comfortably retired, right. enjoying life, and they're not right. living off Social Security. Right, you know? right. You, have, you yeah. can see the fruits. Right, right. And so um, the, the, the most difficult thing for me, as, a, as an, I had to go back to my own experience, mm-hmm. the most difficult for me, uh, thing for me was to try to figure out who I was. You know, where, what, is it, what is it that I stand for? You know, and of course, when you go to a workshop or a seminar, you want to do it just like they did it. Mm-hmm. And that's never what you want. I mean, realistically, you don't want to be a clone of somebody else. No. And so the the tricky part is to, you know, find something that you can attach yourself to and then do it differently. When I learned light painting, my uh, the first workshop I went to was by a fellow by the name of Harold Ross, who is a commercial photographer in Pennsylvania. And his work was the first that I saw. And I said, this is fantastic, you know. And, and I went out and uh, I, I learned a lot from him. But I also learned a lot from four or five other people in the light painting business, not live with them, but studied, you know, their, sure. what they're doing and, and if they had writings and teachings and so forth. And my mission was not ever to do what they were doing exactly. So I took bits and pieces from right. what they're doing and created my own style. And I think that's the hardest part for actually it's probably something that everybody lifelong whether you're a newbie or whether you're a master is to you know really just figure out who you are Mm -hmm. and where you fit in the industry because when that happens I think you brand yourself um, naturally it's not like a conscious effort I'm going to I'm going to change my logo or something like (laughs) that and everything's going to be different it doesn't work that way right and I think that it's a it does make it a lot easier to say yes and no to projects Mm. so you don't have to do what you feel like you have to do right although at some point when you take the big step and you're not you're now relying on photography for if not all at least part of your income you end up you have to start off doing things that you wouldn't necessarily want to do but you do it because you have you know of course um but as time progresses and you start finding that niche you can let go of the things that weren't fun and interestingly as we all know and and as hard as it is to believe when you're not doing it when you let go of the things you hate to do you end up doing more things that you like to do and they become more valuable to others as well and so that gives you the the advantage so there is a you know it's a tough process because we know more when we're older but we don't do as much as we would have if we were younger (laughs) And yeah. like I say, age is a, age is a, is a terrible thing to waste on young people or youth is a terrible <laughs> thing to waste on old people youth or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> whatever. So I don't, I think that there's, um, I think that my opinion is that, that, uh, um, you know, if, if people would stop emulating and start thinking about what they're going to do, creating, being creative. Um, and I, I, I just saw this through my teaching career that people would try to do it exactly what I was doing. I said, no, no, you need to have your own fresh vision on this. Mm-hmm. I mean, this stuff works, but you don't want to do it just like me. Right. You know, um, I had some, I remember one person when I was doing a direct mail had a, one of my forms and he said, could I use this and send it off to, you know, put my own pictures on it. And I said, sure. So we went off and, and he did it and he changed everything except the last page, the, 
designer forgot to swap out my phone number with his phone oh, number. Oh, no, and they were calling So I started me. getting all these phone calls from this for this photography studio in Ohio or something. <sighs> and, and so finally I called him. I said, you know, for $50 a piece, I could get you some great referrals. <laughs> I have all kinds of leads. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a mess. Yeah. Well, that, but see, that's, I think that in, the, in that scenario, like sometimes people get so locked into emulation that they don't even put themselves into a position where they maybe have an aggregate. So like you went to Harold Ross, you said, mm -hmm. but then you also had several other people who you, whose, whose work you learned from and whose techniques you kind of took in. And you gave yourself, I feel like, the opportunity to then create your own, to create your own style, maybe in that, yeah. partially based off your own experience and your own knowledge, of course, right. but then also because you didn't just have Mr. Ross to pull from. You gave yourself the option right. to look at a lot of different perspectives. And nor did I want to. I mean, well, I didn't want to look right. like that, right. you know. So, and now if people look at what I do, they mm -hmm. they don't confuse me with anybody else with right. Eric Curry or, or Harold Ross or any of the right. other folks that, you know, that, that do this sort of thing. Right. Um, and I think that's really important mm -hmm. is, and it's even more so important in the portrait world because you have, there's less variables in the portrait world. If mm -hmm. you think about it, you know, everybody uses the same focal length lenses. Mm -hmm. Everybody uses the same lighting mm -hmm. and everybody has, you know, and then there's this, the story of the processionary caterpillar, and apparently there's this caterpillar that if you put it on the edge of a, you put a bowl out and you put the caterpillar's food in the bowl and you line these processionary caterpillars up in a row along the rim of the bowl, the processionary caterpillar follows the person, the, the caterpillar ahead of them. And they will go around the bowl for days until they finally fall dead into the bowl the because they're just following the other person. They said, that's where the food is. But You're they, kidding. yeah, they, and uh, somebody, at least that's the story. I heard <laughs> I have no idea if it's true. Well, or not, but, but it, it brings up a striking yeah. image, really. Yeah. And it's kind of like lemmings, right? If, right. You're, if you're just following the lemming in front of you and the lead goes off the cliff, you're going to go off the cliff. cliff too. Yeah. And I think the danger in that is that, and I'm, I'm not speaking for everybody, but the danger of that is in, in, in this, in the today's industry, the teaching industry, is special, especially there are a lot of unqualified teachers, mm -hmm. people who are not, who have not walked the walk yet. You know, yeah. they've, they've, they've accumulated a certain measure of success and all of a sudden that becomes their Bible. And, and you, you know, it's really easy to get a megaphone in this industry. Mm. And all of a sudden now you have these people that are following you. And that's not a good or a bad thing. I think, you know, I mean, the internet is wonderful. It's, it's a very evening tool. It mm. allows you at some point, um, you're found out much more quickly than you there is that. otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, there, there are some people that have, you know, wasted a lot of time, energy and resources. Yeah. Um, going in, in directions that they'd probably be better served going elsewhere. They're really dead ends. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not out to, to poo-poo the, the folks that are out there trying to help other photographers. But right. I think there's a lot of, and, and again, those people, just like the newbies in photography, where you see their work posted and you look at it and all their friends say, oh, this is awesome, this is mm. fantastic. And you want to jump up and down and say, no, this is not awesome. Mm. This is not fantastic. This mm. is terrible. But you can't. Right. And I think I see that from my perspective, too, as a, a instructors saying, here, do this and do this. And I want to jump up and down and say, no, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> but I can't. You know, it's not my well, place. Some and, people some people feel like they can. And then you can watch how poorly it goes for them. Yeah. And I think at some point, um, you know, the, 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 uh, their fate is sealed, but in the meantime, a lot of people are dragged into the no, that's, abyss. You know, yeah. They before. become a casualty to some, yeah. to some degree. Yeah. Do you have, um, workshops planned for this year or scheduled I at have all? Two. I, I've decided I used to do a lot of workshops outside of my hometown mm -hmm. and have hosts that would, that would, uh, arrange for the right. location, right. for the hotel, for the, um, for the subject matter and so forth. And it became problematic because sometimes we get to there and they'd say, oh, well, yeah, he decided not to, he didn't want to have us do his pictures or it rained or something. We had no 
we had no backup, you know, yeah. and, and that was just a little stressful. So I am in a really great position in Stevens Point, and you've been there before, mm-hmm. where we have all these great, I have lots and lots of resources, people who have things inside and outdoors, so we're not worried about if it rains or not. Right. And um, so, and the hotel is three blocks from my studio where yeah. we can walk downtown and eat breakfast. So it's a, uh, I'm just, I'm having two workshops this year. One is in, at the end of May and the other is in August. Um, once you become a workshop member, um, then I also hold a, th- uh, a, th- a third workshop just for past students. Oh. And that one's called Light Painting 3.0. And that will be this year. Last year was in Minneapolis. Yeah. This year we're going to hold it in Stevens Point, and we've got okay. a great venue for it. And we've for got al- incredible for, al- for alums. Yeah, d- for right. alums only. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, so and we have you know there's more people that come to that, mm-hmm. but it's a lot more fun <laughs> for them because they can share you know and you can share war stories. There's a right. lot of people um, that get uh, that. Uh, in fact, I've got two students right now that are at the Barrett's auction show in, in Phoenix that have a booth set up, a light painting booth. Wow. One of them is from Minneapolis, and so one of them is from. Um, California, and they have joined forces to to rent this booth. And as they get leads, you know, they actually divided up geographically which part of the country that each one will wow. take the leads from. They they have they have hundreds of leads right now. Uh, the show isn't over yet, but they're going to be light painting until they don't want to light paint anymore. <laughs> and you know, so uh, and it's really it's really neat to see the. Success and these guys are hungry. They want to do right. this, and it's important to them to be able to do that. But th- th- there is a very wide open market for this, yeah. and and no, it's not a competitive market. You're not you're not banging heads against anybody right. else. And even if somebody else is doing it in your town, they don't have your customers. Right. They don't have your clients. So right. it's there's plenty plenty of work. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. What what's uh where can people go to see like sign up and check it out online? Well, the web address is johnhartmanlightpainting.com and then just do a slash workshop. Mm -hmm. If you don't do the slash workshop, you just see what the customers, buying customers see. Okay. Uh, And then the slash workshop gives the information about about where, and I've put all the information, like where to fly into. Sure. um, That's a big problem. Say, I don't want to come to Wisconsin. Couldn't you come to my town? (laughs) I was like, oh, yeah, I could. But (laughs) if I did, then somebody 300 miles away would say, couldn't you come to my town? Right. You don't want to set that precedent. Yeah, yeah. So it's... You know, it's real easy to get to. You fly yeah. into Central Wisconsin Airport, yeah. and uh, we're, we'll pick you up, and, and you don't have to do anything the whole time you're there except walk. So it's it's really kind of a fun time. That's great. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Well, it was fun being here with you, John. Thanks. Yeah. I'm glad I could find the, the place here. Yeah, well, we're at the, at the Gaylord in Nashville at Imaging USA, and this place can be a maze. Yeah, it's enormous. And I put on a lot of steps, and most of them have been looking for, for <laughs> looking things for I can't find. Looking for where you're supposed to yeah. go next. <laughs> thanks again for your time, brother. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Ed. Thanks.